All right, yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we have people everywhere, so I want to say good afternoon to our East Coast people and good morning to our Central US and West Coast friends as well. Again, I am Jaleesa Tindall, a PhD student and member of the DEI committee here in the College of Social Work. Thank you guys, first and foremost, for joining us and thank you to the University of South Carolina Office of Diversity, Equity, and inclusion for sponsoring this conversation. Um, when the DEI committee began to think about Black History Month, we wanted to be sure that whatever we did would spark a conversation in our college of social work community that many are already having across the field of social work. A conversation that challenges a common narrative that centers whiteness and excludes the noteworthy contributions of black people in the history of social work. So today's conversation is one of three ways we've chosen to center this counter narrative. Earlier this month, we developed and presented class modules focused on the same. And if you could all please mute as well, I'm sure it'll be said to you. But First, we developed and presented a class module focused on the same topic. And if you've also been in the Hamilton College lately, you may have noticed the banners highlighting black social work pioneers. We hope that we hope all of these efforts will be a springboard for a longer lasting conversation about diversity, inclusion, accessibility and equity. And so today we have three amazing panelists who will tell you more about themselves in a moment. But first, let me introduce you to our moderator for today. We have Parthena Luke, who is a social worker drawn to issues affecting the human rights to be and to belong. Um, she has she has over 15 experience, years of experience in the field and currently works with defense attorneys as a mitigation specialist and social historian for individuals facing capital punishment. Parthena earned her MSW here at the University of South Carolina and a bachelor's in psychology at Furman University. She is presently a PhD candidate in the USC's College of Social Work and Parthena is also a SEC Emerging Scholar Fellow and as the College of Social Work's inaugural diversity fellow, she works closely with our associate dean for DEI, Dr. Ben Roth, on diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts in the college. Thanks so much, Jalisa. Hey, everyone, um, and welcome. I'm so glad, we are so glad to have you here, and thank you so much for investing your time with us on a Friday. Like Jaleesa said, my name is Parthena Luke and I'll be serving as our moderator today. We have an exciting conversation plan on Black social work pioneers where we will be talking about the influence of Black social workers on the profession, uh, the implications of this knowledge for educators and for practitioners. Now, this is a conversation, not a presentation. So if you have comments or reactions along the way, please feel free to type them into the chat for everyone to see. Questions will be a little bit different though. If you look at the top of your screen, you'll see an icon that says Q&A. So when you have questions, drop them into the Q&A section on your screen so that we can be sure to get to those in the end. Um, but please be sure to keep your mics muted so that we can hear our panelists. Um, now, before we dive into the panel introductions, I want to take the temperature of the room of folks who are who are here with us um, by show of hands in the chat. How many faculty, staff, instructors do we have with us today? Just drop something in the chat, say here or. OK. And how many students do we have? All right, what about 
practitioners. Do we have any practitioners here with us, folks who are in the field? All right, nice. And who's here just because this looked interesting or you're supporting someone, one of our panelists or something? All right, that's awesome, that's awesome. Thank y'all so much. Well, our goal today is that whatever your role is in social work, in, in the social work community, um, that you'll come away with something, a new idea, maybe a helpful strategy, a fresh perspective, perhaps, um, that you can apply for the people that you have chosen to serve. So here's a format to give you an idea of what to expect today. Um, be sure to mute your, mute your uh, mics, please. Thanks. We'll take a few moments for each of the panelists to briefly introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about their background in social work. Um, then I'll kick off the conversation asking questions to draw out some of these high level themes that we should be thinking about. And then with our final maybe 20 minutes or so, we'll give the panelists an opportunity to answer the questions that you all have put in the Q&A along the way. Does that sound good? Great. All right, so let's get started. Now, some of you know that initially we had Dr. Carlton Lene scheduled, but over the weekend she had to back out due to circumstances beyond her control. So we are keeping her in our positive thoughts. Um, but fortunately, we were able to secure some equally exciting panelists to join our conversation. One of which is one of Dr. Carlton Lene's co-authors and co-editors, Dr. N. Yolanda Burwell. Dr. Burwell was a senior fellow with the North Carolina Rural Economic Development Center for eight years. Prior to this position, she taught social work for 25 years in undergraduate programs in Louisiana and North Carolina. She also served as a faculty member of the leadership training program in the North Carolina Rural Center for the past 25 years. Dr. Burwell received her PhD from Cornell University, her MSW from Washington University, and her BSW from North Carolina a and State University. Dr. Burwell, we are honored. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, to start us off, will you please take about a minute or so to tell us a little about your work and what you're passionate about? And don't forget to unmute yourself. Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm so glad to see people come to this program. Um, I uh, got started in social work uh, very early, uh, like in the early 1970s, I mean, yeah, 1970s when I graduated as an undergraduate. Um, and from there, I began to you know, move through, get, get my MSW and so forth. But when I came out and after I got my PhD and started teaching and needed to write, I didn't know what I was gonna write about. Um, and so, uh, and this is a true story. I love libraries. I happened to be in the library one day and a book just fell and hit me on my shoulder. And this book was The Division of Negro Work in North Carolina. It just kind of detailed all the things that were going on in the 1920s here in North Carolina. And as I began to explore and read in this book, I found a gold mine of information that I knew wasn't in any curriculum. Nobody really knew about it. And I got hooked. You know, if anybody does history, they begin, they be they they will tell you it's it's like being on a drug and you can't get rid of it. You get hooked on pursuing. And so I found a gold mine of information and discovered this social worker named Lawrence Oxley, the first in the country to lead a statewide program on social welfare, doing a very segregated, harsh, um, difficult time. And as I began to read his story, I also began to see that it was really an empowerment story of how he was able to organize people, gather people, see people. Um, and so for me, um, this work was not only revolutionary in terms of bringing in new knowledge, 
but also adding to the profession, filling in what wasn't ever there. Um, and so that's why it became so worthwhile to do this and to create this kind of community. Iris and I were in undergraduate school together. She's been my best friend for well over 50 years. We're very connected to one another. And so for us, it's always been about telling the truth about who we really are. Um, speaking truth to power and being able to put it uh, in journals and professional journals and curriculums so that people will have a very different look, feel, understanding of who people really are. Thank you so much. And we're excited about getting into that more with you um, later in our conversation. Um, our next panelist is Ms. Monique Bingham. Ms. Bingham is a social worker and mental health therapist at the Anti-Recidivism Coalition in Los Angeles, and she is a 2022 recipient of the NASW Emerging Social Work Leader Award. She earned a bachelor's in psychology from California State University Northridge, as well as an ASW and MSW from the University of Southern California. Thanks for joining us, Ms. Bingham. Will you share a little bit about your work and what you're passionate about? Sorry about that. We have the light sensors in the room. <laughs> no, no worries. Have. There's no movement. Um, I'm just really appreciative of this opportunity, first and foremost, and thank you all um, for your time. What brought me to the profession was really my father. He spent 20 years in prison, um, so it wasn't there was no question that I would enter into the helping profession, especially considering that if I wasn't a social worker, a therapist, I'd be an artist. I was actually an art minor um, to begin with. And but still, like it was always difficult for me to um, see people battling like with mental illness, battling with drug addiction. Um, or any form of physical element even. So for me, it would it only made sense to learn more about how I could potentially help. And I'll never forget um, one of my academic um, advisors. Um, I had let her know like, hey, I really want to go into reentry work. And she was like, it's something um, that's deeply important to you so she was like you should just do it um because there was some fear i mean my father again he spent 20 years so he's kind of like okay why would you want to work um potentially inside and i was like you know what i don't know that i want to work inside um and it was kind of one of those situations where it's like yes and no and it is dangerous and still every day um things occur that aren't so pleasant so for me and I think for my father, it was with the understanding that um, you have a different level of insight based on having some experiences. So it would only make sense that I do it anyway. Like despite this fact that I'm not very big <laughs> in stature, um, and despite the fact that my own father didn't agree with my decision to do this work, um, he still understood its importance because um, I had been robbed of 20 years. I was very much a part of that system. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and we're definitely looking forward to learning more about um, what brought you and the, the exciting things that you've been doing as well. And finally, we have Dr. Justin Hardy. Dr. Hardy. Dr. Hardy is amazing. <laughs> I feel like Parthena froze and she's probably not going to come back. Let me just quickly jump in. Is that OK, Julissa? Um, and I don't have your bio right in front of me, um, but Dr. Hardy is a graduate from the University of Chicago's uh, Crown School, and he is a new faculty member at Arizona State University. Oh, sorry, I jumped in, Parthena. <laughs> no, thank you. I don't know what happened. <laughs> do you want? Can you, do you want to go ahead and finish? I'm not sure where you. Um, 
left off at, but he um, earned his PhD in social work and social welfare from the University of Chicago. And he obtained a master's degree in social work with a concentration in children and families from the University of Illinois at Chicago. And, and he has bachelor degrees in both sociology and philosophy with a minor in African-American studies from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Welcome, Dr. Hardy. And please tell us a little bit about your work and what you're passionate about. Thank you. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> my work primarily centers on um, the young or in the child welfare system. So as a youth, I spent um, a portion of uh, my childhood in the child welfare system. Um, and so I was very familiar with the system. Uh, and then when it came time, uh, so what I took some time off, returned to school, and I think social work was very, I wanted to stay away from it. I didn't, I didn't want to get a degree in it. I didn't want to work in it. But all the work I did kind of pulled me more and more into it. Um, and I, I, I'm glad I did. So I spent a number of years as a child welfare caseworker um, in Chicago. Um, and then when I started in uh, the PhD program, uh, my research focused around um, young black fathers uh, that are in the foster care system. So we have a lot of research on um, black fathers who have had their children removed from their care, but we don't have really any research on young fathers who enter foster care um, or become fathers um, while they're in the foster care system. And so I think um, what brought me to this work was just like, you know, this black traditions of, of mutual aid, it's kind of always stuck with me. Um, and I think, you know, all, all the money social workers make, that was really enticing um, as well. Wonderful. Yeah, so much to be made. <laughs> Um, now, as we begin our conversation, I'd like to turn our attention back to Dr. Burwell for a moment. Dr. Burwell, you are, in your own right, a Black pioneer of social work, and one of your many contributions to the profession is your chapter on Lawrence A. Oxley and um, this book, actually co-edited by Dr. Carlton Lene, and I'll drop that link in the um, in the chat in a moment, but the book is called African American Leadership and Empowerment Tradition in Social Welfare History. And before we get into the specifics, though, I'm curious about why contributing to this book was important to you personally. Oh, be sure to unmute. First of all, I fell in love with seeing my name in print. And so anytime you can find a way to get your, your words, your voice, your story, your narrative out there, you want to do it. And ours is very good at finding collaborators and avenues for getting the work done um, and bringing folks along. Um, and, the, and so for me, that was that was important but the other piece of it is it was a way to um interject into the profession knowledge and personalities that often aren't really known and so it validates that if they're in this kind of publication then they must be worthy to be spoken about in classrooms or shared uh, in other ways in the profession. Um, and so, you know, at the time we were doing this, uh, we were one of the few. And so after all these years, it's nice to see uh, the Justin Hardys and others who have taken up the baton and kind of carried it on. It's, it's, a, it's as I said, it's a, a important, contribution to the profession that that really needs needed to be made and more needs to be done beyond the encyclopedia of social work for example more needs to be done absolutely and of course you know we don't have time to offer everyone a survey of all the historical black social work pioneers but if you had to choose maybe a couple of folks that we should would start off with who would they be and what are the stories you might tell about them Wow, okay. Um, there are um, people in all sectors of our profession 
that you could begin looking at. There's a social worker named Bolin who was really an attorney, but also a social worker who took great strides to do things. So, you know, she's one of our first forensic social workers. You've got um, Eugenia Burns Hope down in Atlanta who started a, an amazing settlement house in a Southern city and kind of worked on uh, issues that are really, really important uh, even today. Um, and you have um, certainly the educators out there like Isabel Lindsay out of Howard University that really promoted the idea of, you know, not segregating field offices, field placements for students and standing up for students. And so you just have to know what arena they are and where they might have started and, and so forth. So there, there's, there's so many others. I mean, like I said in, in our earlier conversation, you don't have to just pay attention to the national figures like the Whitney Youngs and and so forth. They're important, don't get me wrong, but there are also pioneers right in your backyard in your state agencies that broke ground and led the way in ways that you know you need to talk about. South Carolina has an amazing physician, for example. I forgot her name, but in the 1920s, she started a camp for children because they didn't know how to swim and she had an office. And so you can look at any kind of profession, particularly in those early days when there weren't a lot of professionals out there and what they did to help their community. So you just have to want to look, you got to want to find it, you know, rather than assume it's not there. Absolutely. And you you certainly speak to this in your chapter of the book. Um, and a quote that stood out to me, um, you say, quote, as modern social work practitioners, we stand on the shoulders of pioneers like Lawrence Oxley. Can you say a little bit more about this and what it means for social work practice in the community? I have two points and I know we don't have a lot of time. My first point is doing this work, being doing the history and finding these amazing people taught me two things, certainly more than that, but I'll talk about two today. The first thing is they told me to reframe how I see my people, reframe the narrative, the, the social narrative that's out there about people, because the Oxleys of the world didn't see them as inferior or problematic or pathological. They really saw the power the dignity and the and the beauty in people and organize them to, to stand up for themselves. Remember during the 1920s, they didn't have social programs. They didn't have uh, people that really wanted to help them from a institutional or systemic way. And so they did for themselves. And so, but the narrative was saying, you, if you think of people as crap, you're gonna treat them as crap. Oxley didn't do that. He saw them as dynamic, producing, amazing, contributing people and acted on that. So that's one thing, change the narrative, reframe how we see people. The second piece is that uh, for me, it also taught me that um, particularly in, in this day and time that you have to find the, um, gifts that already exist inside the communities and build on those. You know, you can find all the difficulties, but part of our role is to be opportunity creators as social workers, not to fix people, but to be opportunity creators. And so helping people open doors, but also giving them the courage to go through those doors that's the role for us as social work. And my last point is, um, just because I just finished reading uh, Hidden Figures, one of the things that Oxley and other early pioneers taught me is that they did not have DEI advocates where they worked. They were the first and only. Not only were they pioneers in the profession, they were pioneers in their agencies. Imagine having to work and be the only one and so their antidote for oppression was excellence. 
They had to be damn good at what they did. They stayed the course and they provided excellent, excellent services to the people that they were deemed to work with. They could not have survived without that. And so I would want us as practitioners to have an ethic of excellence in, in what we do because low income people, uh, disenfranchised people, they often get mediocre services. Our role is to be excellent wherever we're charged to work with people. That's Absolutely. the difference. Yes, ethic of excellence. I love that. And that's a great segue to Ms. Bingham's work. Um, Ms. Bingham, you are pioneering in real time. You work every day to fight recidivism and to end mass incarceration. Um, and as I was reading yet a different book co-edited um, by Dr. Burwell and Dr. Carlton Lane, that's about African-American community practice models, which I'll, I'll put that in the chat as well. Um, as I was reading, I thought about your work. Um, specifically, there's a quote from that book that says, quote, many of the same social problems of racism, segregation in housing, insufficient services, and inadequate open and honest communication continue today as in the past. The approaches that our pioneer social workers and social welfare leaders used continue to be relevant to the struggles for social justice, equity, and effective community practice today. Now, this book was first published in 1995, almost 30 years ago. How do you see um, these social problems manifesting in your work, Monique? The good news is um, there's a lot more services I even hear um, from the members that I work with today um, based on some of the progressive reform we have um, here in California and in the same vein, um, we're still very much a hub for mass incarceration. Mm -hmm. So um, in the work that we do, we provide extensive wraparound services which is really the key meeting basic needs and then of course what i do is more so on the micro um, level at this time as i'm pursuing my licensure um, and still one of the things that i often take a note of is always um, regularly i'm having to refer my members back to our life coaches right because the life coaches they're helping more so with as well as i'm assisting with case management, but that's really what the life coach role is at our organization, is to also help with making sure that they find work, they obtain housing, they um, also are able to kind of check in regarding family reunification, where we also um, have legal services um, to assist with, and still we are growing. <laughs> so, because, I mean, the need is, it's still so great, and we're often making changes and something I hope to um, also see us grow in is including families. Right now, we recently got trained in celebrating families intervention. And this is really gonna be a segue to be able to um, provide services to those that are system impacted and not necessarily directly impacted. And Thinking about those, and I'm sorry that I've been in and out, something's going on with my <laughs> internet connection here. Um, but with, with everything that you see in your daily work um, and you know things adjacent to, to what you do, how would you like to see social work just as a profession address these um, social problems that you're seeing? In my, what I see is, can it's, I would say it's trifold. I mean, um, policy is so important. Um, I think that even in as a mental health professional, um, it's deeply important that I begin fellowship going out to the Capitol. We're doing a lot of storytelling um, in order to humanize um, the circumstances that find people sentenced. Um, also, the fact that I'm personally interested in um, more so death row. And um, I think being able to get people on board on a national level 
I think can be deeply um, impactful because even at our organization, we have people that aren't necessarily um, from California, mm -hmm. right? So then you have them potentially looking at returning back to their home states. And at that point, we're dealing with different laws. Mm -hmm. And those things can very much so have a detrimental impact on what happens in their life next. So again, I can't stress again how important um, us advocating um, policy wise is as well as the housing right now. I think um, also the inflation that we've been experiencing um, for my population, they've been particularly um, vulnerable. So I'll even find where it's a it's a barrier, you know, for them to get to our office. Um, so being able to like utilize um, telehealth has been extremely helpful, but then uh, there are times when I have to resource out because like, let's say if it's like a higher risk, um, it is going to be beneficial that they meet with someone in person if that remains, you know, a barrier. And yeah. as well, mm -hmm. no, go ahead. Um, so as well as I would add, um, again, including families. It's very seldom we experience our circumstances in isolation. So being able to get the whole family on board or to some capacity, um, it's really what's going to be winning. My members that I work with that have support, additional support outside of um, what we offer, those are generally the ones who thrive. It's the ones that I find that were previously, as Justin kind of touched on, from a foster care system. And many of our um, members um, have been in the foster care system. Many of our members also have experienced loved ones battling with addiction, as well as who were previously incarcerated. So you see like this cyclical um, thing that's happening. So to address it requires community. That's right. Absolutely. Um, and it makes me think about the ways that we can figure out um, avenues through which we bridge this kind of historical, um, these historical social problems that continue to repeat um, with practice um, in the field. And so one of the ways that, of course, is presented is through social work education. Um, and in a moment, we'll get to Dr. Hardy's work that helps bridge that gap. Um, but Ms. Bingham, um, while at University of South Southern California, you chaired a student interest group and you produce a film that directly links your work to social work education. Can you tell us about that? And it's still a working piece. I haven't been able to like it's yeah, it's a whole thing. <laughs> um, um, however, where the film came about was we were wanting to tell our stories. Um, it was my colleague Deidre Wilson who kind of spawned it and I was kind of able because I have some friends that are in the industry. However, unless you're paying, there's only so much they can do. <laughs> um, so um, that became money definitely became a barrier, but it's still definitely on my plate. I have some other connections, but there's a lot of monetary pieces. Um, however, so, so start us from the beginning with it. What is what what? was it that you guys were trying to bring about? Awareness. Um, usually experiences of incarceration, they're hidden. Like it's not something you regularly bring to the dinner table and converse about. It's one of these, it's very much a, often is stigma associated. I'm very grateful to be where I work now because like even um, as an intern, it's not something I generally brought up. Right, because um, usually it's uh, it is not some. Usually people redirect that whole conversation um, because of the stigma. Um, I mean, my father he went in on a murder charge. I mean, go figure the time that was spent. 
So again, this is something that usually people don't want to discuss. Um, even my own family, it was something that's very much in the shadows. It's like instead we're talking about how well he's doing. Um, we're talking about um, his work. We're not talking about what happened to him when he was away. And I find that very much so still um, outside of my work where it's not something that's spoken out. Yeah. And so when you when you were um, working on, you know, trying to get this film and you were chairing this um, this group within your MSW program, I was really inspired by it because you um, you, you and the others who were involved in the group, y'all were looking at individuals who were in the MSW, DSW, PhD programs who had um, been previously incarcerated. Is that correct? Um, there yeah. were also, we also had people that were allies, um, given that usually they had like an understanding of how like the system, because again, when you're looking at mass incarceration, we can't ignore racism. Um, so it was with that understanding like, oh, like this should definitely be something um, that there needs to be a group on, there needs to be an open space for people to talk about this experience, many hadn't been long out of the system, right? But you see someone who completely turns their life around 180. So to be able to come to a space and to freely um, not have to like put on a cloak, um, it was so freeing even for myself. It's, again, I hadn't, to be honest, previous to that group, I did not discuss my experience. I was even shut up about it. Like, I was like, ah, that's nothing. And at the same time, growing up in South Central LA, um, it wasn't exactly abnormal, right, to have an absentee father. <laughs> so um, with that, coming to this space, being able to hold both stories, to be in someone in pursuit of academia, as well as someone who had some experiences that are um, in the shadows, so to speak, mm -hmm. it was freeing. And that's what we wanted to bring to light. Like, look, this is also a part of my story. Yes, I'm here at USC. And also I have a father who had been previously incarcerated. For others in our group, it was, I also spent time in prison. And yes, I am also an academic. Thank you for that. I had I switched to my phone uh, because of the internet connection issues I was having. Um, that's really inspirational, um, and I'm glad that you were able and the other folks um, at your university were able to provide that safe space for folks. Um, now, along a similar vein, Dr. Hardy, you have made it incredibly easy to implement Black history into social work education. Um, among other resources, you created a reading guide with over 100 articles and books um, detailing Black contributions to mutual aid, social welfare, and social work history. Um, tell us about what sparked this. How did this come about for you? Yeah, thank you. Um, so, you know, history is a hobby of mine. You know, it's not my, it's not my, or it, at the time as a doc student um, and as a master's student, it wasn't my research area. Um, it was just something I was interested in. And so, you know, as a, uh, you know, I have a background in African-American studies and I would be in, you know, during my MSW coursework and my doctoral coursework, I'd hear things about the profession that conflicted with things that, that I knew or like during the discussion of social work history, we would they would totally skip over like key parts of history. And I'd like look at my peers, like, does this like it just it wasn't clicking. Like I knew something was missing, but I didn't know what was missing. So like we talk about social work history and we would skip over like the Freedmen's Bureau. This or when we talk about civil rights movement, it was like kind of like what dominant white social workers were doing and it just it didn't make sense to me and so um at the university of chicago we have a mandatory um or a required 
social work history course and my professor, Dr. Mark Courtney. Um, you know, in the course, he was teaching social work history and I would ask him like, hey, like, um, you know, a lot of what social work history is about, it reminds me a lot of like what the Black Panthers were doing. Like, mm -hmm. it was perplexing to me how some, when social work, well, when work was being done by certain people, it was called social work. And it started to like resonate with me that like, well, when white people were doing that, we were calling it social work, but when black people were doing it, we, we either weren't being taught about it or it was like kind of in the, in the side. So um, in that class, I wanted to know, and, and also I went to the Jane Addams College of Social Work. In that college, I was told things like, Jane, like Jane Adams, like the founder of social work. She did like so much stuff for like the Chicago community and and in the world. And uh, but like she never served black people. Like th their black people were not at the Hull House. There there were black workers at the Hull House. The Hull House never served black populations. And so like learning things like that, I was like, okay, like I need to go back and relearn history. So like I sat down and like and that guide has a hundred resources in it. And with that said, like, it took me a day to do that. And I think it was, it was a demonstration that, and I was also t told things by, um, or I would be reading work, historical work, and uh, there are clear omissions of, of communities of color in there. And so in a day, I sat down on my butt and I was committed to like, just seeing what was out there. And I was amazed by what was out there and so i um you know the so so i'm also part of the social welfare history group and in the social welfare history group that's where i you know that's where I, and actually dr mark Courtney is the one that pointed me to it he's like yeah there's this group called the social welfare history group they used to put out bibliographies just take a look there because you'll you likely find stuff there and so i did and you know a lot of the uh, original work that i found on black social work history was from those bibliographies and so i was just thinking like you know, I should really put out um, uh, a bibliography um, on the things that I've collected. But with that said, like you, you've made you 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 made a comment that when I put the guide out was my intention, but I feel like it's actually been very problematic. You said that you make it very easy to find black social work history, mm -hmm. and when I put out the guide, I was like, this is awesome! Like, I'm gonna put this out there; people will be able to find this stuff. And um, uh, 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 a scholar who does black social work history reached out to me and was basically like, be cautious of what you do and what you hope gets done with that guide, because I don't think that you're going to expect um, what you may anticipate it in happening. So I didn't know what that meant. And I was kind of bummed because I really looked up to this scholar. But as time went on, what the scholar, the the um, concern she had was a concern that I felt, was that people had took this guide, would give it to their students, they'd be like, here's work on black social work history. It wouldn't do anything with it, wouldn't read it, wouldn't cite it, and would check off the box, like in my course, like we have stuff on black social work history. We have a guide, here it is, and that's it. And so putting the guide together, <clears throat> For me, it's fun and it's, it's, it's an exciting way to kind of curate that material, but that it means nothing if people aren't reading it, incorporating it, and in, in, in relearning history with it. Yeah, yeah. you're so right. And um, that's something that did not cross my mind. I'm, I'm glad you brought that to our attention. Um, the idea that oftentimes folks just want to check off a box um, and not put the put the footwork in. Um, so as you were looking at the, you know, that day that you devoted to this, and and even as you began to review these readings afterwards, what were some thoughts or conclusions even that you began to to reach along the way? Was that um, that there's so much on Black social work history out there, and you know, I put that guy together in a day, but you know, while I've been working on my dissertation and, and transitioning to Arizona State, um, you know, I've been, I'm, I'm, version two will be coming out soon, and I've added a couple hundred more 
to that. Um, and I've learned how fun and exciting um, engaging with that social work history can be. And um, Dr. Burrell, she, she mentioned that we get lost in the archives and it's totally, I mean, I've been to libraries digging through microfilm um, and you you get pulled in one area, you learn a little bit about it and you get pulled in, in another area. But um, another exciting thing I learned is like just how fun and exciting um, what you find can be. And if you give me a second. Um, so I looked at the uh, the uh, social welfare history group newsletters and I just wanted to see, OK, like with Dr. Burwell, like what's her history in it? So Dr. Burwell became VP of the, so uh, the vice president of the social welfare history group in 1990. She became president in 2001. But while I was looking at that, she came to um, she became president at a very interesting time. So when I came out of the social welfare history group, it was because we had these, you know, we there was um, we had the, the shootings and uh, the police shootings and uh, countries really kind of grappling with. And I think the profession, like, what do we do next? Right. Dr. Burwell came, became president of the social welfare history group at also a very interesting time. And so if you give, give me just one minute to read this. So this is from um, the newsletter when uh, Dr. Burwell became president. So just for some context, it was uh, December 2001 and the country was still grappling with 9-11. OK, um, and so uh, in that newsletter, Dr. Burwell writes, <clears throat> uh, members and friends of the social for history group. The resurrection of this newsletter comes at such an important time in history of our country and the social profession. Perhaps more than others, historians and keepers of artifacts know all too well the lessons and insights of truth we will have because of the tragic and maddening events of September 11th. I'm reminded of historian John Henry Clark's words, and she quotes, history is a clock that people use to tell their time of day. It is a compass they use to find themselves on the map of human geography. It tells them where they are and what they are, end quote. And then she continues, historically, we point to leaders and actions that parallel today. For every disaster and recovery effort, social workers were there on the front lines and with reform efforts. Whatever there is a hole in the soul of the community or family, social workers were there. We have been present at every war. We have often been the lone voice, like social worker Barbara Lee, to frame the questions and reactions to this awful tragedy in a different way. I found it very interesting in my guide when I was doing this research, just historically how social workers, you know, in, in specifically black social workers and black communities, were dealing with issues historically that we are dealing with now. And for me, the most interesting thing was, I can find a piece that's 50 years old, erase the year, give it to someone, and you would think that it was written in 2023. And so I think we have lessons to learn. And I think as our, the social work profession does a pretty poor job of attending to our history and really forgets a lot of it as well. Yeah, agreed. Um, Dr. Burwell, what are your initial reactions um, to this? part of the conversation. Honestly, um, I'm holding back tears because I had forgotten that I had written that piece. Um, and uh, to hear those words again was like, wow, I, I was really feeling something and I wanted people to pay attention to how important we were as a profession during this time. And we still are as a profession, but I get worried because I don't see our presence out there uh, in the world like I do nurses, like I do attorneys, like I do law enforcement. You know, all those sectors have social workers in them and I don't see our presence. You know, I tell everybody, social work is the most marketable degree you can have. It is, you know, we are the only profession, I think, that understands human behavior the way we do. 
Um, we are there, we are empathetic, which is really needed in the, in the country right now. And so, but we're also those who know how to stand up, how to, how to resist, how to be present in, in tough moments. Who else does that? So for me, I mean, Jonathan, thank you. I will love you all my life for that um, because it reminds us that even though things are moving ahead and we think we're modern, we're not really modern at all. So true. Um, and that also makes me want to go back to Dr. Hardy's um, comments just about you know edu social work education itself. And I'm wondering, um, because we know folks are, several folks are very frustrated with the pace at which we are um, moving as a profession, especially in social work education, to address um, whiteness, colonialism. Um, and you spoke about this a couple of years ago, Dr. Hardy. Um, I'm wondering if you can kind of give us a little bit about, you know, your thoughts on that. What do we do? Where do we start? when it comes to social work education? Yeah, I think, you know, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, 50 <laughs> years ago, the uh, CSWE uh, developed the uh, Council for Social Work Education, created these task forces. There's five of them. Uh, Black, um, back then called American Indian, uh, Chicano, um, Asian American, Black. I think I got them all. Um, and they were tasked with um, charting for like, what do you like uh, among these five groups? What do you feel to be um, concerns that you have of social work education? And they said things like this 50 years ago. Um, and I mean, each one of them had a different a task force report, a different associated bibliography. But I kind of I'm working on the paper right now where I look at I'm looking at them and kind of kind of see the, the things that time together. The things that tie them together are their calls that the social work profession does not have multicultural history, multicultural content um, in their curriculum and that dominant white social work, Eurocentric social work cannot address the needs of diverse populations and that in order to serve black clients you have to have an understanding of black history you have to have an understanding of things like black traditions of self-help mutual aid you cannot a one-size-fits-all approach that ignores that um, will fail and that was kind of dominant among all of those among all the groups and so their call to the profession was you have to have multicultural content in there. You have to have critical content in there. Fast forward to today, we're still 50 years later, we're still having those same arguments. Like our profession cannot learn from its past. And I just, I, I think sometimes I, I struggle with it. And it, you know, as, as, a, um, as a professor also, I struggle with that. I don't, sometimes I'm concerned that students don't even have a solid grasp of history, period, right? Mm -hmm. and, I th and I think that sometimes it's, maybe it's because they have a hard time understanding how social, how history and social work history can be connected to things like practice. Um, and so, um, yeah, I mean, I think in order for us to kind of move forward, we have to look at the past in, 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 all, of, in all of these um, uh, reports, like they provide like, instructions for the profession like have multicultural content in there have a course that covers um history outside of kind of white dominant um history and i think the the, the most important lesson i got from those is that they 50 years ago they understood the connection between colonialism and racism right like racism upholds systems of colonialism they're embedded they're intertwined you cannot address one without addressing another but if you look at today in efforts that social work has you hear things like anti-racism and i often say like 
I feel like social work is there. Like we're like you're so close. Like if just mm-hmm. keep reading on and you'll understand that there's another part connected to that. And so I think 50 years ago they were saying you have to address both of them together. You cannot separate them. And fast forward 50 years, we're trying to address racism or making decolonization efforts separately. We're going to continue to fail unless we kind of merge them together and make um, those efforts together. Yeah, uh, Ms. Bingham, you're, you know, you just finished your MSW, I think a couple of years ago. Um, how does this resonate with you, this conversation around social work education? Yeah, it was like a little over <laughs> a year now and seven months ago. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so I totally agree if it were not for the fact that my grandmother, she got her degree, um, her bachelor's in African American studies. My grandfather, huge literature buff, huge historian, always talking. (laughs) So it's like having those libraries, um, I personally found really helpful because even um, when I went to school, when we talk about, yes, there were classes on diversity, but we didn't really talk about black social workers. So, um, so yeah, that definitely um, hit Mr. Uh, Dr. Hardy. Um, it It's upsetting and in our profession, when we talk about, we can't ignore this whole idea that's still very pertinent, which also, Um, was touched on the fact that in our profession, it's heavily white. Um, And that's not to discount, but anyone like, hey, if you're going to get out in the field and you want to help, more power to you. That's beautiful. That's wonderful. However, it is so important to have that cultural backing, um, that understanding to come and to sit and to sit with the fact that unless you've experienced it you don't really understand Mm -hmm. and that's okay and that's why we need more black and brown and red and yellow people in our profession Mm -hmm. because that's ultimately um what is going to being at the table, that's how we get changes to happen. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, we're at our one o'clock mark, we have until one fifteen. but as we kind of begin to wind down and remember if you have a question that you would like answered, put it in the Q&A section at the top of the screen. Um, but I wanted to bring us back around to our historical black pioneers. Um, Dr. Burwell, referring to black social workers, you and Dr. Carlton Lene, you wrote, um, quote, their contributions to community practice, planning, and policy development at the local, state, and national levels during times of strict segregation and desegregation are fascinating lessons in resourcefulness and tenacity among pioneer social workers. Thematically and historically, Race work or work for the socio-political inclusion of African Americans is at the foundation of community practice among this population. So in the end, it all comes back to community. And I know Dr. Burwell, you are very passionate about community. What advice would you give to educators and practitioners? Can you hear me? Okay, yes. okay, good. Um, as I told Parthena earlier that I was trained uh, to start with the community first, um, way back in the early 70s. And I came of age doing um, the Black Power Movement, the Women's Movement, the Civil Rights Movement, um, uh, uh, protesting peace for Vietnam, all of that. And so I, the idea about the value of social movements kind of being the wind that drives your learning and and your stance out here in the world uh, is really important. So for me, I think that, you know, you really have to kind of think about the idea that people live in communities. Um, People live 
with others. It may be a village, it may be, you know, a, a, a group of business owners that meet together, uh, folks that go together for lunch, their support systems, whatever. But people do have communities and starting there, you got to, to understand that those are often the first source of help for many people. Um, I grew up in a world where going to an agency was the last thing you wanted to do. I work with rural North Carolinians all the time. Going for help is not in the institutional realm first. It's the last thing you want to do. And so until we begin to understand communities as the source of help, not problems, we won't know what to do with people because ultimately people return to their communities. We all know that. And so one of my um, concerns is that social work has drifted so much into the medical model and pathology of the individual that we have forgotten that the origins of social work was really around I three. Mm -hmm. I got three. I mean, I'll Huh? No, uh, sorry, not you. So. Okay, community practice. And so, and that's, that's why I get called all the time to work, you know, do workshops and trainings because that's where I start. That's the missing piece. If you're doing economic development, you know how to put up a building or, or attract a business, but you really don't know how to work with people. How do you how do you do that? That's the contribution that I think social workers bring, knowing how to mobilize and work with people and understanding the human experience is really important. That's our gift. So we're deeply needed, deeply needed out here in the world. Yes, we are. Um, and time has passed so quickly. I wish we had another hour to talk, um, but we do want to give um, everyone a chance to um, ask their questions. And it looks like we're having some issues with folks finding the Q&A section. So I think right. it's okay for you to drop your questions in the, um, the chat over um, on the right, I think that's also available at the top, but you can put your, your questions in there as well. Um, so Julissa is gonna be helping us with that. Um, Julissa, are you seeing, let's see, I see, well, I see a question from Tiffany Johnson. Um, I am a resilient coordinator in my community. How is resiliency used um, in any of the speakers work? Um, do you guys complete ACEs? with the individuals. Monique, what about you? Do you guys, how, how do you use resiliency in your work? We definitely follow a strengths-based model. Um, person first, again, mm -hmm. I know our organization is so different. The culture is so different, so rich and so diverse. And I really appreciate that, having different voices. And there's so many people who haven't gotten their um, degrees in social work, but it's like people like Romarilyn Rawson who are just leading. She's a really good friend of mine and mentor. And she's also Black. <laughs> So she's often speaking into my life as far as like, these are the areas you need to look at. Um, the importance of education is always at the forefront, even at our organization. So that alone kind of speaks into our work of resilience. You're talking about people, most of our staff is also previously incarcerated. And that alone, when members are coming in, they're able to see themselves. Mm -hmm. And it speaks to their resilience. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's see. I'm curious if any of you are following the emerging field of police social work, especially as it relates to reducing police brutality. We are in conversation. I am not a director. <laughs> So, but we are in conversation um, surrounding that. Um, we'll see where it goes. You know, <clears throat> it's it's interesting. Uh, so the question is on this em uh, emerging field of police social work, but 
Salesforce has a long tradition of being involved in it. So right. um, if you look, if, if you just Google social welfare history group, we put out a historical bibliography on social works um, response to policing. Mm -hmm. And so in that we have a section on um, uh, the kind of, the kind of uh, hist uh, works around social works history in attempting to engage in successfully and, and unsuccessfully in that. And there's, I forget how old some of those articles are, but there's a, we have a bibliography that, um, uh, that has a bunch of stuff on that. So I think it's, I don't think it's, um, it's definitely not emerging. It's been happening for a long time, but I think now we're, it's, we're re-engaging with, should this be something that social workers should engage in? And if so, how can it be done that, um, is responsive and reflective to the needs of communities of color. Dr. Burwell, did you have any thoughts about um, policing and social workers doing um, law enforcement type work? I just uh, flashing on remembering some early social workers uh, doing that work, uh, even through juvenile courts or, or um, you know, other other avenues. Um, I think that um, again, it's important to, to understand that until law enforcement culture understands local culture or local neighborhoods, there's always going to be a clash. Mm -hmm. uh, and so until we can find some way to translate those two cultures with one another, um, we won't, you know, and I think social workers would be good brokers of that um, if people would, would, would allow that. So that's, that's just a thought. I think it's a rich area to, to be involved in. Um, and, and again, once you have some successes, then that becomes a model that other people can start practicing from. Mm -hmm. um, Brandy Anderson asks, Dr. Hardy, do you have any new documents or supporting materials in the works that folks can use in their social work courses? Yeah, uh, it's in oh, the work. Okay. Uh, no, the, the bibliography that I just linked, that's uh, bibli bibliography that I worked on that was social works response to police and it has a bunch of policing, social work and policing um, and social work engaged um, in police forces in there. But yeah, so my guide, my black social, black contributions to social welfare history are um, guide. I'm working on revising that now. And so I have about almost 200 new uh, articles, uh, books, uh, videos, uh, bibliographies, podcasts. Oh, good. And that, yeah, that, that I'll be adding to that. And so, uh, yeah, I, that'll be out like in a, a month or two. And so, uh, when we do, I released the other one. Um, through, um, this new one, I'll, re I'll release it under the Social Welfare History Group. Um, and so I'll put something on Twitter when it's there and it'll be um, on the Social Welfare History Group website. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I think maybe we could take the next two questions possibly. Um, so Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is targeting Black Studies, CRT, DEI. How do you suggest Black scholars and practitioners continue to advocate and spread the knowledge of not only the history of Black social work, but equity under given circumstances? Do you want me to go or? Sure, anyone. You know, yeah, I, I thought that that question might come up and I'm trying to bite my tongue, but so let me try, try to be civil here. Um, I think that we're living in a day and time where people are not only turning back the clock, but trying to uh, enact black codes again around who is worthy, who is included, who should be involved, what we should do, all of that. And so 
My question would be uh, that there needs to be some form of resistance. Um, because again, what this panel has talked about and, and this program has talked about, without the inclusion of the full history, the balanced history of everybody, Florida is one of the most multicultural states in the country. Without that kind of history and background, how will people be served better? How will people live and contribute better? So, you know, for, for me, I think the, the question really is how do we how do we counter the foolishness in a way that uh, sustains people liberation and creates opportunity out there for people. Um, because again, like anything, if people think it can happen in Florida, then it can happen in Arizona, it can happen in Wisconsin. I mean, so, you know, we're, we're at a stage where in people are really calling on the segregation of people, not the, uh, beauty and involvement and opportunity for everybody, not the beloved America that John Lewis talks about. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I, I know we, I said we'd have probably time for a, a, an additional question, but I don't think we do. Um, I've truly enjoyed our time together. And, and of course, in this limited time, we couldn't name all of the Black historical and contemporary pioneers, but I do want one more favor from everyone as we, um, as we begin to close out, um, if you will take a moment to think about um, Black social work pioneers that you know, past and present, um, who are change makers. And if you will put their names in the chat for all of us to see, because we need to know their names. Um, and as we begin to um, close out, I'd like to have Dr. Ben Roth, who is our Associate Dean of DEI here in the College of Social Work, um, just come on and share a word with us. He is a really great example, in my opinion, of a white man using their privilege um, to advance um, our, our cause in, in social work. And beyond. So Dr. Roth, will you come mm -hmm. on and say something to us? Sure, thanks, Parthina. Um, and really, thanks, Drs. Burwell and Hardy and Monique. It's been a real honor to have you all uh, on the on this call. And I, I don't know, my sort of offline text stuff has been blowing up as people have been saying, this is um, so important. We need to share this recording. We need to um, find ways. And I'm really, I, I mean, I think the conversation that, um, that Parthina together with um, Brandy Anderson and some other doc students helped to spark here at our college last year is really speaks to what Dr. Hardy said about what does it mean to go beyond uh, checking a box and having some additional readings on a syllabus to doing the work that Dr. Burwell challenges us to do and that Monique is in the business of doing. Um, challenging systems and um, I think um, giving voice to those um, who otherwise may not have access to the microphone, um, but collectively working towards uh, a shared vision for social justice. Um, and so it's just it's been an honor to have you guys a part of this. And I would say that as a college, um, and we are a work in progress, um, but this is helping us get closer. Um, a couple of other things just to add. Uh, first of all, that um, Julie and Parthina helping to um, get the grant and plan for this event. Um, talk about other um, black social work pioneers who are change makers in your own right. Uh, thank you so much. Um, Nikki Wooten, who's on the call. Um, asked me to share the um, the Bridge to Faculty Scholars Program that we have here at uh, the University of South Carolina. Um, it's, an it's an opportunity for us to bring in um, scholars, um, scholars of color to uh, as two year postdocs to do work um, to do work in our university and in our College of Social Work that we think can continue to, to amplify and, and advance um, this larger cause. Um, I just dropped the link in the in the chat and would encourage you to take a look and, and share that link with others if you wouldn't mind. Um, and then lastly, the um, the Newman Institute for Peace and Social Justice. Um, Idy Quincy Newman is someone here in the state of South Carolina who is um, who has historically been a change maker. 
And we have a, an institute that um, is named in his honor. And each year we have a spring lecture series. This year it's on um, April 19th when Dr. Sadie Logan, who wrote the book on, um, on, on Newman, is going to be speaking with us. It's co-sponsored by um, Bobby Donaldson's office. And we are really excited about the conversation that we'll have, um, ongoing conversation uh, that's related to this topic and, and really what I think uh, reflects um, a couple of years of, of effort here at the college. Um, so thanks, Parthina, for, for letting me have the microphone back. It's back to you to wrap us up. Sure. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Ms. Bingham, Dr. Hardy, Dr. Burwell. We are eternally grateful to you, and we hope that this conversation continues well beyond um, this meeting here today. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.